Did you know that the moon has significant amounts of platinum in it? I did not know that, no. no. Yeah. Do you know where I'm going to go with this story? Oh, no, it's not mining on the moon again, is it? <laughs> Your favourite subject. <sighs> OK, well, let's get into it. Um, how is it that we didn't know that we had platinum on the moon? OK, so I should say it's not just platinum, it's the platinum group of metals, mm-hmm. which is platinum, palladium, rhodium, ruthenium, Iridium and Osmium. Nice, we should set that to music for the Elements song. (laughs) Look, the reason we didn't know that it was all there is that this is just metals thought to have been delivered to it uh, by asteroids hitting the moon and no one's really thought of it in that way before. Oh, right, okay. Um, And, you know, obviously, if you look up at the moon at night, there's a lot of asteroid impact craters on the moon. Very pockmarked, yeah. What's happened is an independent researcher called Jayanth Chenamangalam, he's modelled the fraction of lunar craters that are thought to have been created by metallic asteroids, uh, and then the number of those asteroids that had enough platinum group metals in them, uh, and how many would have crashed on the moon with a velocity small enough to leave some of that metal behind. Um, And they've plugged all this into the model and found that out of uh, 1.3 million craters on the moon, um, with a diameter greater than a kilometre, nearly 6,500 were made by asteroids containing commercial amounts of platinum. Wow. Okay, so people are definitely going to want to go up there and get it. They are. I did see a report that found that a rough estimate there could be $1 trillion worth of platinum and other metals available for mining in these lunar craters. Yeah, a trillion dollars sounds, well, it is a lot. Um, But it's weird how they make those kinds of estimates, isn't it? Because like... You know, that's the dollar value on Earth, but you've got, you have got to go and get it I first. Spend is, an extraordinary amount to yeah, get there. Yeah, like there's that, that metal asteroid in the asteroid belt called Psyche, mm. and there's a mission to, to it now, um, and that's worth, supposedly worth $10 quintillion. <laughs> but, you know, it's a kind of meaningless sum because, of, you know, it's floating around in the middle of nowhere. Mm. Uh, you know, it's not there to be exchanged on the metal exchange. (laughs) And then there's all these thorny questions about, okay, but who gets the money? Who does that value belong to if if we were to go get those metals? Yeah, yeah. well, that's, I think that's the really, that is the really thorny part of it, Mm. isn't it? And it's like the arguments we talked about on the podcast recently about mining the deep seabed. Um, You can say, okay, well, let's do it because we're going to save the the destruction of the surface of Earth. We're going to mine on the seabed or mine on the moon instead. And I asked Jayanth about that, uh, and here he is. Mining is something of a necessary evil. We need the resources. But mining them on Earth affects wildlife habitats, pollutes the environment, uses a lot of water, and emits a lot of CO2. So one obvious benefit of moving mining off Earth is that we can mitigate these issues. A slightly less obvious benefit is that mining space resources provides a way for astronomy in general, and planetary science in particular, to pay for itself. Today, astronomy is done to satisfy our curiosity and has very few practical applications. It's mostly paid for by taxpayer money, meaning that research funding is at the mercy of governmental policy. If we can monetize space resources, private enterprises will invest in the exploration of the solar system an activity that will directly benefit planetary science. I mean, that's quite, I hope that would happen. It's quite optimistic to think that's what would happen, that it would be reinvested in planetary science. But you also think a lot of it would go into pockets of uh, billionaires. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not really buying it. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what about the legality of it? Is there law governing this? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, there's untested law. There's the Outer Space Treaty from 1967, um, and that supposedly sets rules for activities beyond Earth. And that includes stuff like space resource mining. Mm. Um, and here's the what it says. Uh, Outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, is not subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty, by means or of use or occupation, or by any other means. Um, and so, but, but there's a dispute about whether asteroids that would count as a celestial body mm. or whether if you go up there privately, um, whether that counts as national appropriation. And you can bet that private companies are going to try and challenge that and test that, aren't they? For sure. uh, they're not going to go to the moon, and as companies are planning, and not try to monetize what they dig up there. No, they're not. Although I do think this kind of study boosts the idea of a, a space-based economy, mm. which is what really is going to hap- have to happen eventually if we want to get stuff done in space. And um, you know, we we hear about um, Jeff Bezos's plan to move. Uh, heavy industry off Earth onto the moon. 
Things just like... looking at your face. <laughs> I know, uh, you know, you're a horror <laughs> of like, mining facilities on the moon surface. <laughs> I just, I mean, I, and... I've, I've talked about this before, but it's one unchanged constant. We can all look up at the moon and it's the same as it has always been mm. for all of our ancestors. Yeah. I would hate to see that change. Yeah, yeah. Um, advertising on the moons. Oh, the, yeah. oh, it just gets worse. But but you could put data centers on there, um, uh, and that we you know we spoke last week about the the huge environmental impact that AI is having, and that's even now before AI has really taken off. So I asked uh, Jay Anth about that again as well, and here he is. There's currently some interest in space-based solar power and space-based data centers. These are large and massive structures and require vast amounts of materials to construct. So one of the ideas that people have floated is that we could use resources from asteroids, say steel from a metallic asteroid, to manufacture components in space and then assemble it all in space. I haven't studied the feasibility of this idea, so I can't comment on it. But in principle, for humanity to be able to construct large-scale structures in space, we will need to exploit resources in space. So, I mean, he says the moon is a much better target f- um, for doing this kind of thing than asteroids because uh, the moon's got gravity for one thing uh, and asteroids are further away than the moon. So it's easier to, to do this kind of construction. Yeah, I mean, it, it's still just... <laughs> if you did want to construct... Heavy industry on the moon is still yeah. quite a big thing to pull off, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, you know, I, I guess it's all... Well, it is massively pie in the sky. Mm. Uh, I mean... In principle, if it if it relieved pressure on Earth, um, that would be great. But you know, almost certainly, it's going to be done to fuel consumption, mm. ever more consumption, and fuel the creation of wealth. Um, and I think that's the real problem with a lot of plans of going to the moon. Um, I mean, you know, if you if you listen to Elon Musk type people, they literally talk about colonizing it and Mars. Um, whereas, you know, what about the exploratory curious reasons we want to go there to to and those are the things that we can certainly celebrate mm, right yeah um and if we're not careful those get left behind yeah and, and i asked jayanth about that too and here he is by cultural impact if you mean how lunar mining might conflict with the cultural significance of the moon i don't see the two as being mutually exclusive the moon is culturally significant to pretty much every civilization on the planet yet five of our nations with five different cultures have landed on the moon and three have brought back pieces of the moon, with more to follow undoubtedly. Of course, that doesn't mean that we should go and deface the moon. I believe it is possible to responsibly mine the moon, and international cooperation frameworks such as the Artemis Accords are a step in that direction. So there you go. You can responsibly mine the moon, Penny. I he so. so. <laughs> <laughs> what are the Artemis Accords again? Uh, so, well, they're a non-binding framework right. um, governing the exploitation and utilisation of outer space and it, in particularly the moon. Um, and that will basically allow commercial exploitation um, up there. It's been signed by 55 countries, but not by China or Russia, um, which are obviously big space powers. So, you know, it's all, again, untested. Mm.